There's no coincidences for a Christian. All right, well, we're gonna begin. I, I found this story, I, I heard this story. It was, it was kind of, it's kind of funny. This, this guy was at a train station. And he was waiting for his train. And an employee of the train station came up and put a sign out that said, delay 30 minutes. And so this guy went up to the employee and he said, what happened? What happened to my train? And he said, well, it got derailed. And so the guy says, well, how long is that gonna take to fix? And the employee says, hours. And he said, but your sign says 30 minutes. He says, that's the only sign I could find. And I was thinking about this, this series of, of signs called, are we there yet? We're looking for the signs of Jesus' return. We're looking for those things that cause us to know that time is short now. And we don't have just one sign. <laughs> We've got lots of them. The Bible's filled with them. And so we're going to be looking at some of these signs as we continue, those that are lining up with today's present time, our news, our lives. But before I go any further, I want to, again, reassure you that the fact that we have these signs is God speaking to us saying, it's okay, it's supposed to happen. It's reassuring to know that the things that we see in our world were actually prepared ahead of time. And thousands of years ago, God wanted to make sure it was written down so that when we got our Bible, we would see and know that these are the times that we're watching for. And that is reassuring. Last week, I reminded you, and I'll do it again, that when you go to a doctor, and you're going to have surgery or something's gonna be done, the doctor explains to you what's going to happen, tells you what will happen post-operatively, so that when things do show up, a pain here or there, or something that seems off, or something's really uncomfortable, you remember, oh, yeah, it's supposed to happen. He warned me, he told me, I can relax. It may be uncomfortable, but this is all part of it. And the Bible's the same way. And sometimes we don't look at it like that. Sometimes we look at it as, as being, all these things are happening and we're getting scared. But that's not the point of God warning us about these things. The point is to prepare us for these things like a doctor would do to let you know, hey, God's still in control. Things are okay. This is supposed to happen. You can relax. It's not gonna be comfortable. It's not gonna be pleasant. But know that this is all part and parcel of the things that will happen before Jesus returns. And when we see these signs, Jesus says, look up, because I'm coming back. Start getting your house in order. Start getting your life in order. I'm coming back. And so this series is about looking at the signs that have been foretold in the Bible and applying them to today. And they're not just one-offs. I wouldn't be giving this message if I thought there were just little bits here, little bits there, like in the past. It's all coming together and it's increasing. So we're gonna be looking at some of these today. We're gonna to be looking at a few actually, uh, pulling it together like a drawstring. So before we do, let's pray. Lord, you, you have prepared us, you are preparing us. And I pray that, that as we go through these days that your Holy Spirit would Give us that assurance in our spirit that you are in control, that there is nothing to fear, that these are all to happen, and that we will be excited knowing that these are signs that you're returning to make everything right, and you are returning to call us to you. So thank you, Lord, for what we're gonna learn today. In your name, Jesus, amen. I wanna share something with you. Um, I was given permission to do this. It's a story that's not about anything about me, so I had to get the permission. We have some really dear friends, Christian friends, Rainy and Susan, some of you know them, and they're just, they're wonderful people. We've known them for years now. And Rainy's mom passed away uh, a few years ago. 
But before she passed away, she was in um, a nursing home, in a senior's home. And towards the end of days, they, she was put into a part of the home for end of days. It's like the palliative care of the senior's home. And she, she was a woman who loved Jesus. One day, just not long before she passed, for a short time before she passed, the priest came in, and he came to visit her. And as he walked in the room, he noticed that, well, she's in bed, of course, palliative care, you're in bed, but she's dressed. She's looking nice. She's got makeup on. Her nails are done. And there's somebody doing her hair. And he's thinking, he probably was thinking, I don't know what he was thinking, but I would be thinking, where is she going? <laughs> she looks like she's leaving. She looks like she's going to go out somewhere. But he knew that she was mentally still okay, and she knew that she had very little time to live. So what is, what is she doing? Why is she looking like this? Why is somebody getting her hair all done up? And so he said to her, he couldn't resist, he said, Lillian, what are you doing? Why are you all dressed up? Her reply was precious. And it's something that I've held on to. I heard the story at the funeral. It's something I've held on to these years. And she said, I have to look pretty for my Jesus. Uh, it's the most beautiful thing. It still, still moves me to think that she was looking for her savior. She was looking to be with her Jesus. She wasn't afraid of death. She wasn't focused on the dying. She was focused on life. She was focused on meeting her Lord and Savior. And I thought, wow, what a representation of the church as it should be. We're called the bride of Christ. Jesus is called the bridegroom. And we are to be preparing ourselves to meet him, to be excited to meet our Lord and excited for him to come and take us home. And that's how we should be. That's how we should look at these days that we're in. You know, Lillian wasn't keen on the idea of dying. I gotta tell you, it wasn't her, it, it wasn't something that she was, she was comfortable with. And dying is not something to be comfortable with. But she wasn't focused on the dying, she was focused on eternity. When a woman is, is going into labor, she's, she knows she's gonna experience pain. Lillian knew she was experiencing dying. But you, if you focus on that and not on what's coming out of it, then it's hard. So a woman in labor looks forward to the baby. Lillian, in her dying process, was looking forward to her savior. And this is what I want us to take away from, from these messages, that the time that we're going into is not comfortable, and it's not going to be comfortable. It's, it's going to be painful, it's going to be chaotic perhaps, it's going to be confusing in all sorts of areas. It's going to be just wrong. But we can't focus on these things because that'll just make us fear. We'll take our eyes off of Jesus. We need to focus on the fact that all these things mean that something's happening. It means Jesus is coming back and it means he's going to come and get us soon. We need to focus on the end as we go through the process. In Matthew 25, one to 13, there's a parable of 10 virgins, and, and I've referred to this number of times I've taught on it. But there's something in it today I want us to recognize. There's something, a point in it that I wanna make. Now this, this parable, for those who may not know it, is, is a story, um, a life type story. It's based on real events in Jesus' day, uh, but it has a spiritual application. That's what a parable is. And so what Jesus was doing, he was talking about a wedding. And in the Jewish traditions, the, the bride and groom don't plan the wedding together. They are separated for a year or more, whenever it is that dad tells the son to go get her. But the bridegroom goes home, he makes place for her, she stays home waiting for him. And sometime during that time, the dad says, go get her. And so they make arrangements, he gets his friends together, the best man, the attendants, 
and they get everything signed, everything ready to go, and then around midnight or thereafter, the bridegroom says, let's go get her. And the groomsmen, the tenants all run ahead of time. They're yelling in the streets. He's coming. He's coming. Get ready. Let's get ready. The bride and the tenants, her tenants hear it, and they start getting ready. He goes in. He takes her home. Now, in this parable, there are ten, ten women. And these ten women represent together the church. But each one individually represents us. And while they were waiting for the bridegroom to come, which is Jesus, the representation of the church, us, they fell asleep waiting for him. They fell asleep, passed out. And then the call came out and they woke up. Some were ready, some weren't. The story goes on. But the point I want to make today is the call went out to wake them up. And I have, in all my days of being a Christian, I have never seen so many pastors, heard so many pastors, calling out to congregations, saying, wake up, this is it, he's coming, get ready. And they're all talking about it. They're all preparing their congregations, and as pastors, we should be preparing our congregations, that Jesus is returning. This is the time to wake up. Now last week, I was talking about signs in the sky. And I wanna say that every one of my messages is not an end. This isn't a sign and it's done. It continues as we get closer to Christ's return. These signs are gonna continue and they're going to increase. It's like a living document. The word of God is alive, and what we're going through is fulfilling scripture. So when last week I was talking about the, the planets, just to give you an example of things that are moving closer, I talked about what Jesus said in Luke 21, there'll be signs in the sun, moon, and stars. And, and we talked about that. But since then, something else has happened to add to it. And if I was giving you that message today, I would have had this added to it. I just found this out. So, when there's an alignment of three or four planets, it's no big deal. When there's an alignment of five planets in a row, it's uncommon. When there's an alignment of six planets in a row, that's something to take note of because that's rare. And if there's seven, then it might be once in a lifetime thing. It's, it's something that you really have to take note of, something to get excited about because it is that unusual. So I found out yesterday that on June 3rd, just a few days from now, there's gonna be an alignment of six planets all lined up. That's rare. I take that as a sign, but you might not. You might think, well, it's rare, but it's happened before. No big deal. And God knows that. And so what did God do? He says, you think so? Wasn't he enough for you? Well, let me give you another one. This rare alignment's gonna show up again in August of this year. A rare alignment, twice. And you might be thinking, okay, well, that's something to kind of take note of, but I don't know. God says, okay, not quite, not quite convinced yet. I'll give it to you three times. I'll throw it in again in January 2025. Three times in a row, short time, within a few months, a rare occasion, a rare occurrence, an alignment of the same six planets will be seen those three times. Now, what does it mean? I don't know. All I know is when there are signs like that, we need to take note. Now, this is off the record. I just found this interesting. Do not tell people this is my doctrine and I'm speaking heresy because it's not in the Bible. But I found it really interesting that six planets are being revealed three times. Six, six, six. Is that not interesting? I think it's interesting. What is 666? It's a number of man. That's what it is. It's a number of man. It's also 
the, the number used to identify the Antichrist when he comes. That was interesting. Does that mean he's going to show up? I don't know. But I know that he's here already. He has to be if we're in these days. He's working behind the scenes. He hasn't been revealed yet. But he's there. He's working. And I believe that in these coming months, we'll see more of his activities. I don't think he'll be revealed to us, but his activities definitely will increase. So I'm thinking, okay, well, is there anything else weird happening in the sky? And then I found something else. There is that rarest of alignments, seven in February. So you get the six in January and the seven, which is a number of completeness. It is the number associated with God. I thought, wow. Okay, so if, if the activity of the evil one is increasing, God's giving us a sign, hey, I'm still here. I'm still here. And it's a sign. So curious, I just, I went a little farther to see if I could see three sevens, just to be curious. But it doesn't go that far, but just to say, there is something coming in June and August next year. But there's no information as to what the alignment is. I wouldn't be surprised if it wasn't seven again. I wouldn't be surprised. That, that would be something God would do. But however it is, these are unusual signs God said to his word says to note that there will be signs. So whether it has anything at all to do with Antichrist rising or anything like that, note that something's happening. This is not usual. And God is emphasizing it. And that's what he does in his word too. If there is something repeated three times, two or three times, a story repeated, then we know that we should take note. That's how God underlines things. So that is continuing, and I encourage you to go back and look at the things that we've covered already. There is also some activity going on towards the Ezekiel 38 being more fulfilled. I challenge you, take a look at the things that we learned already, and see if you can see in the news things that are going on. But today, today we are going to turn to the Old Testament in Daniel 2, 31 to 35, and for the sake of time, I am going to give you the context verbally instead of reading it all because it's, it's a lot of reading to go back and, and understand it. So basically the story is that King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, way back in the day, conquered Israel, took it over, took captives, and one of the captives was a young man named Daniel. He's the same guy that was in the lion's den. Those of you who've grown up with Sunday school, you might remember Daniel on the lion's den. Well, that was when he was older. This is when he was younger. And Daniel was captured, and God had put within him the spirit of prophecy. He used Daniel to be able to tell the king things that he wanted him to know, warning him, encouraging him. So one day, one day this king, Nebuchadnezzar, had a dream. It was a very disturbing dream to him. And he wanted to know what it meant. He knew it would mean something. And so he, he called in all his wise men, and he called in the magicians, and he called in the priests, and he said, I've had this really disturbing dream, and I want you to tell me what it means. And they said, hey, no problem. Tell us your dream, and we'll tell you what it means. And he says, hmm. Not so fast. If you really are working with God, God will tell you my dream. I don't have to tell you my dream. You tell me my dream. Just pretty sly. And he said, well, who can tell a dream? It's your dream. So he threatened to kill them. So God gave Daniel the dream. Daniel came in and told the king his dream. And that's where we're going to pick it up. And we're going to pick it up in Daniel 2.31. You, O king, were watching, and behold, there was a single great statue. That statue, which was large and of extraordinary radiance, was standing in front of you. And its appearance was awesome. The head of that statue was made of fine gold. 
its chest and its arms of silver, its belly and its thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, and its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You continued watching until a stone was broken off without hands, and it struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and crushed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed to pieces all at the same time, and they were like chaff from the summer threshing floors, and the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them was found. But the stone that struck the statue became a great mountain and filled the entire earth. All right, so the statue is representing what is going to take place in the future. And Daniel will tell him in verse 38 that the head of gold of that statue is representation of King Nebuchadnezzar and his empire at that time. But then he goes on to explain the rest. And he says, and after you, another kingdom will arise inferior to you, then another third kingdom of bronze, which will rule over all the earth. Then there'll be a fourth kingdom as strong as iron. Just as iron smashes and crushes everything so like iron that crushes, it will smash and crush all these things. And in that you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay, partly of iron, and it will be divided kingdom. It will have within it some of the toughness of iron since you saw the iron mixed with the common clay. And just as the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of pottery, so some of the kingdom will be strong and part of it will be made will be fragile. In that you saw the iron mixed with common clay, they will combine with one another in their descendants, but they will not adhere to one another, just as iron does not combine with pottery. That verse we're gonna go into. It's a lot of reading, I know. But that verse, there's something in there. We'll go on. And in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed, and that kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put to an end to all these kingdoms, but it will itself endure forever. Just as you saw that a stone was broken off from the mountain which without hands, and it crushed the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will take place in the future. So the dream is certain, and its interpretation is trustworthy. So I'm gonna just break it down for you. Those first four kingdoms, they've already happened. The prophecy has been fulfilled. Scholars all agree that it was the Babylonian, Persian, Greek, and Roman empires. Done. Prophecy fulfilled through history. But the fifth kingdom, that one speaks of the end days of the world when it is run by the Antichrist. Revelation 17, 12 to 13 says, in the last days, the Antichrist will rule over a group of 10 nations, which represent those 10 toes. Jesus is the rock, breaking the final kingdom to pieces. So that's how it's been interpreted. But there's something else, something that has been revealed in these days that hasn't been revealed before. It's almost like a little nugget, a mystery put in there. Because when you read 43, in that you saw the iron mixed with common clay, they will combine with one another in their descendants, but they will not adhere to one another just as iron does not combine with pottery. Clay, dirt, earth is what we're made out of according to Genesis when God created man. Genesis 2, 7, then the Lord God formed the man of dust, of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a living creature. In Job 33, 6, Job says, behold, I belong to God like you. I too have been formed out of the clay. We're the clay. The clay is us. That's humanity. What happens is crushed, it's abomination. It's something that God doesn't want to have happen and he's going to destroy. I believe it's the AI technology. It's the iron, it's being put into humans and it's an abomination. God created us in his image, not in the image of machines. And you're going to see that Satan wants to steal away what God created and destroy it 
make it imperfect. And now he's done this before. If you check into Genesis, you're gonna see that these fallen angels, these bad angels, married women, humans, and had children with them. They had atrocious, evil, unredeemable creatures produced, only part human, no longer in the image of God. And then the flood comes. Satan's doing it again. He wants to change humanity. He wants to take away the purity of who we are in the image of and move it into something that isn't of God any longer. He's going to be, and is already, using people to implant people with computer chips into their brains to help them to do good to them. It's a humanitarian purpose. It's for a good cause. Those who can't see, those who can't walk, those who can't speak, those who can't hear, the paralyzed, there's AI to now kick in and give them their life back. It's a better way, a humane way to live. But who could argue with that? Who would say, no, I know there's technology to help you walk again, but no, you shouldn't do that. Uh, it sounds like it would be such an evil thing to say to somebody who's paralyzed, or somebody who can't hear, somebody who can't see. Who could argue with it? If we have the technology to feel, to move, to see, how insensitive would it be for us to say don't? But I want to bring out today something that was emphasized in the Bible three times. And that is in the end days, Matthew 24, Luke 21, Mark 13, Jesus says right in the beginning, don't be deceived. There is going to be a great deception that comes upon the earth in the end days. And I believe that this deception is being revealed even today. And I believe the deception is to have us believe one thing while other stuff's going on behind the scenes. There's an agenda. Things start with good plan, you know, before evil rolls in. It started with Eve being convinced that the fruit was good. She knew she shouldn't eat it. She thought she shouldn't even touch it. But by the end of it, she was convinced that it looked good, it seemed like it would be tasty, and a good cause, it makes you wise. AI is continuing to purpose a good cause. It's for a good purpose. Bring it in. Implant it in people. Look what good we can do. People will endorse it and embrace it. Did you know that there's a company called BrainBridge? Anybody heard of it? BrainBridge. Last night. Hmm? Last night. Yep, I heard about it just recently too. They have brought forward the world's first concept of a full head transplant system integrating advanced robotics and art artificial intelligence. A complete head and face transplant. I'm getting the feeling that we've been here somewhere. We've heard of this before. Maybe it was primitive, but does the name Frankenstein mean anything to you? What could go wrong? But it, it's going to be produced and rolled out as being positive technology, something to help people. And I'll tell you what's going to happen. I can, I can see it coming already. They're going to say, you don't have to die. You get enough of these parts in you. You get enough of this robotic and interface system inside of you. You don't die. We just replace your parts. You keep on living forever. We'll upgrade you even. You'll even get smarter. I guarantee people are going to run to this. They're going to think, wow, I'm not going to die. I can live forever. 
What could go wrong? A lot of evil comes in under disguise of being a good cause. And that's why I called this message for a good cause. When I was looking over this message and I realized how much information is in there, and the information I need to give you on deception that Jesus talked about, the information on how this deception is being rolled out and increasing, and where we are right now. This message took on way too much time. I've said it before, there is a fine line between a long message and a hostage taking. And so I have decided that what I'm gonna do is tell you this. I will tell you the secret that Satan's been using and will continue to use and increase that a lot of people, most people, don't see. You're gonna have, you're gonna have information that is going to help you in the days ahead to not fall into the deceptions that Satan's gonna put out there that Jesus warns us about three times. And then I'm going to tell you where we are right now in the present day with the prophecies. And it's all gonna to pull together. So I'm gonna end it here, but I'm gonna encourage you to Look forward to next week as we pull it all together. It is a cliffhanger, amen? Right, you'll come back, right? Okay, let's pray. Lord Jesus, I do thank you. I thank you that you reveal these mysteries. I thank you that when you told Daniel to seal up the scroll until the end days, that it is unrolling even now that we are seeing those things that were revealed to him. Thank you that you've, you've given us these. You're, you're not gonna allow us to get ambushed. You're not gonna allow us to wonder where you are and what's going on. And you're not gonna allow us to fall into those things that would cause us to, to leave you, to leave our faith. You've given us these so we grow in our faith. And I thank you for that. Now, Lord, Help us to continue to watch from the things that we've already learned. Watch for the days ahead as more is being fulfilled in your word. And we thank you in your name, Jesus. Amen.